Truth be told, uh, I never graduated from college, and uh, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a college graduation. <laughs> Steve Jobs was one of the most successful entrepreneurs of our time. He co-founded Apple Incorporated and was its CEO until his untimely death in 2011. Under Jobs's leadership, Apple became the world's most valuable company. He was also responsible for introducing some of the most iconic products of our generation, including the iPod, iPhone and iPad. Jobs was a visionary leader and his impact on the technology industry is still being felt today. He was a master of innovation, and his legacy will continue to inspire people for generations to come. So in this video, I'm going to share with you the story of Steve Jobs and how he turned Apple around from being a failing company to one of the most successful businesses in the world. And most importantly what lessons we can learn from Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was born on February 24, 1955 in San Francisco, California. His biological parents didn't want to keep him so they gave him up for adoption. Jobs was adopted by Paul and Clara Jobs. Jobs grew up with one sister, Patty. His father, Paul Jobs, was a machinist who fixed cars as a hobby. Jobs remembers his father as being very skilled at working with his hands. Job and his family moved to Mountain View, California in 1961. This area was becoming a center for electronics. People were starting to call it Silicon Valley because silicon is used in the manufacturing of electronic parts. Job spent a lot of time working in the garage workshop of a neighbor who worked at Hewlett Packard, an electronics manufacturer. Jobs also became a member of the Hewlett Packard Explorer Club. There, he saw engineers demonstrate new products and he saw his first computer at the age of 12. He was very impressed and knew right away that he wanted to work with computers. While in high school Jobs attended lectures at the Hewlett Packard plant. On one occasion he boldly asked William Hewlett, the president, for some parts he needed to complete a class project. Hewlett was so impressed he gave Jobs the parts and offered him a summer internship at Hewlett Packard. Jobs attended Reed College in Portland, Oregon, for two years after he graduated from high school in 1972. However, he only stayed for one semester and then dropped out to visit India and study Eastern religions. In 1975, Jobs joined a group known as the Homebrew Computer Club. One of the members, Steve Wozniak, 1950, was trying to build a small computer. Jobs became fascinated with the marketing potential of such a computer and decided to start his own company with Wozniak in 1976. They called it Apple Computer Company in memory of a happy summer Jobs had spent picking apples. They raised $1,300 in startup money by selling Jobs' microbus and Wozniak's calculator. Jobs was one of the first entrepreneurs to understand that people would want personal computers. He encouraged Wozniak to design an improved model, which they called the Apple II. This computer had a keyboard and came in a sleek, molded plastic case. The Apple II went to market in 1977 and sold very well during its first year, with sales totaling $2.7 million. Within three years, the company's sales reached $200 million, an amazing accomplishment. This proves that personal computers can create an entirely new way of processing information. Apple was forced to improve its products to stay ahead of the competition in the early 1980s. The company introduced the Apple III, but it had a lot of technical and marketing problems. People didn't like it, so it was withdrawn from the market. Apple fixed the problems and reintroduced it later. The company had a record-setting public stock offering in 1981 and it quickly entered the Fortune 500 list of America's top companies in 1983. That same year, the company recruited PepsiCo, Inc., President John Scully to be its chief executive officer, CEO. Jobs had convinced Scully to accept the position by challenging him, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? The line was shrewdly effective, but it also revealed Jobs' own near-messianic belief in the computer revolution. Jobs continued to be a driving force behind Apple. In 1983 he unveiled the Lisa. It was designed for people who had little computer experience. 
however, it did not sell well because it was more expensive than personal computers sold by competitors. Apple's biggest competitor was International Business Machines IBM. By 1983 it was estimated that Apple had lost half of its market share to IBM. In 1984, Apple introduced a new model, the Macintosh. It had small pictures on the screen called icons. People could use it by pointing at an icon and clicking a button using a new device called a mouse. This process made the Macintosh very easy to use. However, the Macintosh did not sell well to businesses because it lacked features other personal computers had, such as a corresponding high-quality printer. The failure of the Macintosh signaled the beginning of Jobs' downfall at Apple. Jobs resigned in 1985 from the company he had helped found, though he retained his title as chairman of its board of directors. Jobs soon hired some of his former employees to begin a new computer company called Next. Late in 1988 the next computer was introduced at a large party in San Francisco, aimed at the educational market. Initial reactions were generally good. The product was very easy to use, had a fast processing speed, excellent graphics displays, and an outstanding sound system. Despite the warm reception, however, the next machine never caught on. It was too costly, had a black and white screen, and could not be linked to other computers or run common software. In late 1996, Apple was struggling financially and almost went bankrupt. They hired a new CEO, Gilbert Emilio, who decided to use Next Step, an operating system that Steve Jobs had created. Jobs then came back to work for Apple as a consultant. However, the board of directors soon became unhappy with Emilio's inability to turn the company around and asked Jobs to become the CEO again. Jobs quickly teamed up with Apple's old enemy, Microsoft, got rid of the agreements to make Mac clones, and simplified the company's product line. He also made an award-winning advertising campaign that encouraged potential customers to buy Macintoshes. What is important is what he did not do, Jobs resisted the temptation to make machines that ran Microsoft's Windows OS, nor did he, as some urged, spin off Apple as a software-only company. Jobs believed that Apple, as the only major personal computer maker with its own operating system, was in a unique position to innovate. Though Apple did not regain the industry dominance it once had, Steve Jobs had saved his company. In 2001 Jobs started reinventing Apple for the 21st century. He showed that he was still a master high-technology marketer and visionary. In 2000, Apple made a decision to create their own retail stores. This was a good idea that turned out well. The stores were opened in mid-2001. At the time, it was not clear if this was a good idea. PC maker Gateway was closing down their own retail stores, and most people thought Apple would lose money by opening their own stores. Steve Jobs explained that only in an environment fully controlled by Apple, with Apple-trained staff and only Apple-compatible products, could the superiority of Apple products be fully appreciated by consumers. In 2000, Jobs realized that he had made a mistake in betting only on digital movies. So he changed the company's focus to music. At that time, MP3 files were very popular and people were not spending their time shooting movies. Out of this realization, iTunes was born. However, there was still a problem. Although there were great digital camcorders and cameras, the digital music players available at that time were not very good. They were also ugly. That is why Jobs started a crash development program to build an Apple-branded MP3 player and ship it before that year's holiday season, the iPod was born. On October 23, 2001, Jobs introduced a new white device to a small group of journalists. He said that it was called a digital device. Jobs said that it would be able to hold 1,000 songs. The iTunes app would work with the device. But no one knew how important the device would turn out to be. The iPod was successful from the day it came out, even though it was released for Macs only. This was because its goal was to help sales of the Mac. A lot of people needed a good MP3 player at the time, and the iPod was a bit expensive but a lot of PC users still bought it. Jobs and his team had to decide whether they should keep making a Mac-only iPod or make it for Windows 2. Jobs was originally opposed to making it for Windows but he changed his mind. 
The first Windows iPods were introduced in July 2002 at Macworld New York. However, it was soon becoming clear that iPod benefited from music piracy, and that its sales could go even higher if there was a legal way to download music. Steve Jobs didn't wait for the music industry to reinvent itself. He went to all record labels to negotiate landmark deals that would lead to the introduction of the iTunes Music Store in April 2003. Ironically, one of the arguments he used was that the risk to music labels was quite low, because of the Mac's small market share, iTunes was still Mac only. The first compelling legal alternative to illegal music file sharing, the iTunes Store was an instant success, selling 1 million songs in its first week. It not only helped the sales of iPods, but it eventually reshaped the whole music industry. Even though iPod was doing well, Apple didn't stop there. In January 2004, Jobs introduced the iPod Mini. It was a smaller version of iPod that people could buy for $249. The iPod Mini was successful partly because it worked with Windows computers. This helped to make the iPod even more popular than it already was. The iPod became so popular that it changed the music industry and the way everyone listened to music. Probably the most important change it carried was that of Apple. Employees at Apple saw that they were right to strive for perfection and ease of use with products like iPod, unlike the Mac, which still didn't grow beyond its 5% market share, iPod garnered Microsoft-like numbers of 80% of the MP3 player market iPod made Steve Jobs realize that Apple could become the greatest technology company on the planet. Around 2003, he started a secret project to develop a new type of computer. But in 2004 to 2005, he realized that the technology that had been developed for this computer, including a revolutionary touchscreen technology, could also be used in a mobile phone, which was even more appealing. After two more years of development, iPhone was introduced at Macworld on January 9, 2007. This keynote is often considered the pinnacle of Steve Jobs' career. iPhone was not only a digital convergence device, but also a force of disruption for the traditional phone business. Steve Jobs had negotiated a landmark deal with wireless carrier AT&T before he introduced iPhone. In exchange for exclusivity, the carrier would pay Apple a share of all their iPhone subscription revenues. And of course, AT&T could not put any software on the iPhone, and no logo either. This was an inversion of the traditional master-slave relationship that carriers entertained with phone manufacturers OEMs. In the long run, it really turned the phone industry upside down. Apple knew that if iPhone was successful, it would change the company. Jobs announced at the end of the iPhone introduction that the company's name would change from Apple Computer Incorporated to Apple Incorporated. The computer division, Macs, still mattered, but they now accounted for a minority of Apple's revenues, and this trend was not about to be reversed. This moment in company history was highly symbolic. In late 2003, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. This type of cancer can be cured by surgery, but Jobs refused to have the surgery for nine long months. Instead, he tried alternative diets and treatments, including acupuncture and seeing a psychic. Only in July 2004 did he agree to have the surgery. He looked healthy for the next five years, and spoke publicly of being cured of cancer at his famous Stanford commencement speech in 2005. At the WWDC keynote in June 2008, many people noticed that Steve Jobs looked very thin on stage. This caused concerns about his health to start appearing again. These concerns became more frequent until December 2008, when Apple made an announcement that Jobs would not be speaking at the Macworld 2009 conference. They said he was taking a medical leave of absence for six months. The truth was that his cancer had come back and he was very close to death. In January 2011, he announced he was taking a new medical leave of absence, this time without saying when it would end. People started talking about his upcoming departure. However, he deemed iPad and iOS so important that he still made two major public presentations at Apple events. The first one was the introduction of iPad 2 in March 2011, and the second one was WWDC in June 2011, where he introduced iCloud. iCloud is a product that is important to him. It was not only a product, 
but a master plan to get consumers to adopt iOS devices and lock them into the Apple ecosystem. The 2011 iCloud, which allowed users to sync email, documents, and media across their Macs and iDevices, was an iDevices, was only the first step in that direction. It was crucial to Steve Jobs, who clearly considered iOS to be the most important of Apple's businesses, and the key to its future success. So finally what can we learn from Steve Jobs about success? Firstly, it's important to have a clear vision for what you want to achieve. Jobs had a clear idea of what he wanted Apple to be, and this helped him to make decisions and stay focused. Secondly, he was never afraid to take risks. When others were cautious, Jobs was willing to take bold steps forward, and this often paid off. Thirdly, he was relentless in his pursuit of excellence. Apple products are renowned for their design and quality, and this is something that Jobs was always striving for. Finally, he was a great communicator. He had the ability to inspire people with his vision and sell them on his ideas. These are just some of the lessons we can learn from Steve Jobs about how to achieve success in life.